Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Hey, hey Jake, before you get started, uh, what do you think about that shirt Edward was wearing this morning? That's the ugliest shirt I've ever seen in my oh, life. Man, I'm telling you, yeah. I think he got a good will. Yeah, he wore that just to make me mad because I te teased him about it one day. Anyway, welcome. Good morning. You are here on a great day, as Edward said. My name's Jake. I'm one of the elders here and one of the paid uh, ministry staff, Joe Fields, one of our elders. And uh, man, we're excited this morning because what we're going to do is we're going to give you an overview of Summit Heights from a biblical perspective. Joe's going to be talking a lot about why the church exists, uh, why we've been commissioned to do what we're going to do, and then also from why, why in the world is Summit Heights here? And what are we doing? And why do we do what we do? This is the membership class. If you've ever been to membership class, this is basically the revamped membership class. But here's what we've learned over the last few years at Summit Heights. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. It means they get confused. It means they get, they, they just kind of go crazy because they don't know what's going on. And if we've learned anything at Summit Heights, we've learned that we could be a lot better in communication. And what we want to do is we want you to know and understand why it is we do what we do. And vision can leak. And so the more times that we can get before you and share vision of what God's called us to do, then the better off we're going to be as a church. And so you're going to hear about all of our ministries. All of our ministries will be on display. You're going to hear about all of our groups. All of our groups are going to be on display. You're going to hear about the structure of our church. You're going to hear about our strategy. You're going to hear about our statements. You're going to hear everything today. And then at the end of the day, we're going to challenge you to get involved. Because we believe that you are here for a purpose, okay? And so those packets that you have in front of you, there's a call to action to those. And so we'll get to that at the end. But for now, I'm going to kick it over to Joe. Okay. So let me begin by saying that uh, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, the reason I always preface things that way is that I think it's real helpful, especially in church, for you to realize that if the enemy can't steal your salvation, he'll steal your identity. And the more you lock in on your identity of who you are, it really helps to frame a lot of things. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Protestant. I'm not Baptist. I'm not Church of Christ. I'm not Presbyterian. I, I don't like religion, period. I, I became a disciple of Jesus at age 21. Um, I, I don't see myself as a religious person because I really don't like what American tradition has done to religion. So I am a disciple of Jesus, which means this. What I do is I go back to the Gospels all the time and I say, how did Jesus do that? How did Jesus see that? How did Jesus teach that? What was Jesus' reason for doing that? And one of the questions I always, I'm a why person. It got me in a lot of trouble in school. Because they tell me to do something, I'd say, why? And they say, because we told you to. That's not good enough for me. I need a why. So I'm a why person. So why did God make the church? Why does the church have a full-time staff? Why do we have so many people on staff? Why do we do what we do in church? Those are huge issues to, that send me back to the Bible saying, what was God thinking when he made the church? What was God intending by having church look a certain way. And, and I always felt like if I could dial in on that, it would help me to be more tolerant of being in 
church. Because to be honest with you, I'd rather be fishing. So how does God grab a guy like me and put me in church and make me actually like being here? And a big part of that is I understand what God's trying to do here, and that's what's done it for me, and that's what I want to share with you. Let's go to the first slide we're going to talk about uh, this morning. Statements strategy and structure and why those things are important. Most people that are part of a church are part of a church to go to church. They really don't understand what God's got them there for. And so this morning we're going to unpack our statements, what, what we say that is the groundwork of everything in our statements. A strategy means if that's what God wants me to do, how does he want me to do it? So that's why it's good to have a strategy. And under the concept of structure, structure is nothing more than a big picture of how the thing is organized. And I know a lot of people, I don't want to know how the sausage is made. I just, just, I just want to go to church. Realistically, if you understand how God puts the church together, you're going to connect very quickly and assimilate very quickly to your role. And that's why we need to teach on this and help you to understand that because the faster you can say, that's what I'm good at, that's what I like to do, that's where I'm strong, that's where I fit, the faster you can do that, the better it helps you to feel like you have great purpose in the kingdom of God because that's what, that is what God created you for, to have great purpose in his plan uh, moving forward as a church. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll start off with our statements. We actually have two very strong statements. The first statement uh, is Jesus. We believe that Jesus is Christ and Lord, and what both of those things represent are very powerful to your identity as a disciple of Jesus Christ. The word Christ is not his last name. It is a descriptive of his mission. He came to seek and save the lost. So when you say Jesus is my Christ, what you're saying is he's my Messiah. He's my deliverer. He's my Savior. Uh, it is under that side of our relationship with God where God gives us grace and mercy and love and redemption and, and all the things that just are the warm fuzzies that we love to have with God. And sometimes what happens is we get honed in on that side of the relationship and it becomes a bad marriage because it's all about what God gives us. And sometimes we don't think enough about what we give God in return. And to have a great marriage with God, it's important that we understand Jesus the Lord. Acts 2.36 says, this same Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. So if you accept one by necessity, you have to accept the other. Jesus is my Lord. So what does that mean? It's not a term we use a lot. And so Lord is not the same thing as Christ. Lord means master, king, ruler. So by implication, if he's the ruler, what does that make me? I am subject. I am called to be in submission to him. I'm called to be surrendered to him. I'm called to be obedient to him. So in a healthy relationship with God, there is this huge identity of God loves me and forgives me and has mercy on me, but in a healthy relationship, God has expectations of me, and I really want to meet those. I want to make God happy. God has to see a lot of stuff in this world. He needs followers who believe so strongly in him that we become the good news to his eyes of what he sees in our world. And so when you buy into the idea that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're buying into not just, I'm getting the ticket to heaven. You're buying into, I am a disciple of Jesus. Help me be like Jesus. I'm not the least bit concerned in how to keep traditional religion going. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Christ. I want to be like Jesus. That's the driving mission of understanding the Lordship of Christ. That is our statement as a church. That's what we're going to teach about. That's what we're going to hone in on. That's what we live towards is being disciples of Jesus, saved people who want to honor God in the way we live. You said relationships seven times. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure because... That's what you told me. To our say. mission statement... 
And our purpose statement, why we exist, is to connect people to God and others. And the bottom line is, say it again. Relationships. Relationships. We want people in relationships. We believe in relationships because when you look at Jesus, the Messiah, and you look at Jesus, the Master, it primarily is all about relationships. He came to restore a relationship, a broken relationship that we had with God. And then as we follow him as Master, we are in relationship with him to be all that he's created us to be. And so everything we do at Summit Heights is going to run through this purpose statement, this mission statement. It's going to run through this funnel of relationships. We want to connect people to God the Father. All right, We want them to know Jesus the Messiah, and then we want them to grow in Christ as they follow him as Lord. And we believe if we can do that, then we can also connect them in their horizontal relationships and have better horizontal relationships with everybody in their circle, not just Christ followers, but unbelievers as they go out and then reach the lost. And so everything we do in this mission statement is for that purpose. We want to connect people to God, and we want to connect people to other. And at the end of the day, the bottom line is relationship. Yeah. Before we go to the next slide, let, let me help you to see this, that when you buy into Jesus the Christ, it is going to change your relationship to God. But when you buy into Jesus the Lord, it's going to transform your life. That's really where transformation happens. Because when God says, do this, don't do this, and you follow it, that's what changes your life. God, God got to me when I was 21 years old. I didn't grow up in church. I was a pagan. And through the grace of God, he brought uh, a young woman into my life that flirted with me in class. And uh, That's not what she told me. <laughs> helped, me to, helped me to come know Jesus. And that's what I realized, that my life, the trajectory of my life was so off track until Jesus the Lord said, here's the track I want you on. That's what transformed my life. So if things aren't working well for you in Jesus, hone in a little more on Jesus the Lord and, and, and figure out you know, what's there that, that can really help you change that trajectory in, in the Lordship of Christ. You'll see a radical difference. Let's go to the next slide. So if Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Christ and we're here to connect... What's our strategy? How are we going to do that? Okay? Well, Jesus told the 12, his last statement before he left the earth was, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to make disciples. Disciples of who? Okay, so we're disciples of Jesus. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. Go into all the world and make disciples. Baptize them. Baptize the people that you make disciples. And then teach them to obey everything. You see the process there? Go out and win. So we boiled it down to three little simple world, words. Go out and win people. Train them. And then send them out. What was the training about? The training has to do with morals, habits, money, time use, uh, life involvement, uh, scripture, so training is this broad thing, and then sending out, as Jake will talk about in a minute, it doesn't mean you've got to go to a mission field to be on target here with what God wants you to do. But when you understand, my mission in life is to win, train, send. I'm here to win people, I'm here to train them, and I'm here to send them out. Most specifically then, if that's our mission, the, the easiest place to start is with children. So we are a church honed in on the next generation. If I can get to those kids before they, before they do what I did by the time I was 21, they can build a foundation uh, in their life that will stand them good for the rest of their life. They will be so much more effective, so much more productive, so less shattered if we can get to them and build that foundation, that's why we as a church, we hone in on the next generation. If you're more than 50 years old, I'm, I'm 65 years old. I, I like to say sometimes that I've had my run at the church, okay? I'm 65 years old. You don't look a day over 64 and a half, brother. Well, my wife takes care of me. Okay. The, 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 uh, 
You got me all messed up. Okay? The church is not for you age, if you're over 50. You can't do that the church at is this the... age. Okay, so. I literally forgot if where If you're I over was. 50, the church is not for oh, you. Oh, yes, you're... okay. Yeah. So if you're over 50. Gosh, I hate this aging thing, you know. <laughs> Okay, so if you're over 50 years old, here, here's, my, here's my take. I'm talking to you if you're over 50. I'm not saying that you don't have a place in the church, and I'm not saying the church is not here to help you and all that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is our biggest help we can be to the kingdom of God is to support the work that these young pastor people are doing. That's our best thing we can do. That's why we want to aim the church at the next generation. A 50-year-old pe person sometimes comes out and says, I don't like the music. It, it, it's not my style of music. It's not my style. I don't really care. I'm not here for the music. I'm here to participate in the next generation's salvation, which means I'm here to teach and give and influence. And if I didn't like the song, whoop de doo I'll deal with that in another place. But I'm, I'm here if you're 50 years and above, we are here for the next generation. We are here to rescue and save the next generation. That's our real, that's our real place where we can fit. That's why our financial help. Young people don't have any money. <laughs> I didn't have any money when I was young. I was poor as Job's turkey. But we can give to help the next generation's salvation. That's why it's so important. Why do we have a paid staff? We have a paid staff because I really do want people thinking about this 24-7. I want them involved any time and any place they can be involved. I don't want them working at some doofus job under a doofus boss who stresses them out. and They don't have time to think about how to reach people. And they don't have time to think about you know, what to do next as a church. So we approach Edward and a guy like Jake and we say, guys, quit your job. Come work full time thinking about nothing but how to move this church forward. I don't want Jake and Edward bypassing the wind train sin model to just become everybody's birthday party attender and everybody's hospital attender. They go to the hospital a lot, but I really don't want them doing that so much that they're not asking questions. How do we do better at winning? How do we do better at training? How do we do better at sending? I want these guys focused on ministry and reaching the world. Uh, we'll take care of each other. If you're 50 years old, we'll take care of each other. We'll call each other and show up at the hospital. We'll call each other and go to a birthday party. But these guys don't need to spend every single hour doing everything, including fixing the toilets. We want them on mission. When trained sin. And so we pay our staff a full-time salary so that they can do nothing but thinking about reaching this world and setting the models in front of us so that we can work together with them to get that done. And part of that is small groups. And that's kind of Jake's specialty. Yeah, and we're going to talk a lot about small groups here in a couple of slides. So just, just file that away. But I, but I want to hit on the send aspect of when trained sin. Uh, I, I think for a lot of us... The, the perception is, is that when you get one and you get trained and you're to go to the other side of the world or you're to go plant another church or you're to go staff another church. And that's actually how Summit Heights started. All right. Edward, myself and Ashley were trained and then sent out to start this church. But not everybody in here has that calling. And so when we're talking about when trained sin, what we're ultimately talking about is we're not necessarily sending you to Africa. We're not sending you to another town to staff another church. We're sending you to youth ministry here. We're sending you to love one ministry here. We're sending you to small group ministry or CR ministry or prayer ministry here. We're sending you across the street to your neighbor. We're sending you across the cafeteria table in your schools. We're sending you across the dinner table in your own family. And so we've got to retrain our brains to know that when we're talking about sending you out, all we're talking about doing is we're training you for ministry and 95% of you are going to be sent somewhere within the ministry of this church. Exactly. That's why we have the statement, a church is not measured by the number of people it seats. How big is your church? 
We don't measure the church by how many it seats. We measure it by the number of people we are sending out. That is the real health of a church, not the number of people who are sitting still in a church house. So let's go to the next slide and we'll start talking about the structure of the church. Now, some people don't want to know how the sausage is made. Okay, so you're all organized, whoop de doo Okay, but here's the cool thing about understanding this. If you can understand how the church is structured, it's going to be your fastest way to assimilate into what your part is. Just like in a family, um, we, we do, in our family, we always divvied up responsibilities. Dad does this, mom does this, and we organized so that we got our home moving in an orderly fashion. Well, a church has to operate the same way. We have to have a structure which helps us to make sure we're covering all the bases. So at times we'll talk about thing, five things we really do well, five things that are the reason God made us as a church. Why? What did God intend when he put the church together? And we call this a little bit our blueprint for a healthy church. In other words, we want, we want to make sure we are covering all the bases God intended for the church to be in order to make sure we're not too overly pushed on one side, honing in on one thing. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about our structure. You'll notice it's elder-led. Our church is elder-led which basically means that we don't have one person at the top of a pinnacle. We're not a top-down model where Edward sits at the top and dictates to everybody what we're going to do. The church is run as an elder body. There are eight men in that room, and we sit and discuss and we talk about what I'm about to show you. So if you ever wonder, what do those guys do in those elders' meetings? This is what we do. We hone in on this structure model, and we figure out how are we doing over here? How are we doing over here? How are we doing up here? And, that, and th those become the, uh, the, 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 the um, borders of our discussion. When people bring new things to us and say, when are we going to do this? We say, how does that fit into where we're doing and where does it fit in? Does it fit into what the church ought to be doing? So that, that's pretty much what we do in elders' meetings. We, share, we do what we call a shared mantle of authority. In other words, in that room, we don't have one person whose vote trumps everybody else. You can't believe how many times we've outvoted Edward and Jake and how many times I've been outvoted and Alan has been outvoted. I mean, because it's a room full of mature disciples who are there for one reason, that's to move the church forward. And sometimes we're right about that, sometimes we're wrong about that, and somebody spots it, and then we discuss it, and that solves it. So what we do, look at the bicycle wheel that's up here. That's actually a, a pretty quick, every time you see a bicycle go down the road now, you're going to think about this thing. This is called, I'm going to explain to you what dynamic tension is. If you were to look at a, a wheel on a wagon, like an old school covered wagon going across the prairie in, in Oklahoma back in the day. It had big old wooden spokes on it. And the purpose of that was every time the wheel came around, those big heavy post spokes would support the weight that was pushing down in the wagon. And that's how that wheel was designed. A bicycle wheel, on the other hand, is designed entirely different. A bicycle wheel, its weight is supported in the middle, and it's got all those hundreds of little spokes that you used to put baseball cards and balloons in so it would sound like a Harley going down the highway, okay? And maybe as a kid, you're like, man, how does that little bitty spoke support all that weight on my bicycle? You may have also noticed, too, that at times the wheel would vibrate and what you may not have known is, had you gone around the, the spokes of the wheel and, and made sure they were all tight, you would have pulled all that tension equally to every side, and you would have created what is called dynamic tension to keep things balanced. So using that model, we said, is this a balanced church? Is this a healthy church? Can this church run smooth? Well, to do that, you have to know what the spokes are that you need to be tightening down on. So part of what this helps to explain is why Edward preaches the way he does. 
Why is he all over the map? Why is he one week he's talking about this topic and another week he's talking about this one and then he's over here and then he's over? Why does he do that? He's doing that because he's tightening spokes. As an elder team, we get together and, and he'll say, where do I need to be next? We need to tighten up here. We're way too loose over here. We need to tighten up over here. We're way too loose over here. So these spokes work like this. I, in the center is doing everything we do to the glory and honor of God. We call that magnifying God. We want to lift God up. We want to worship God. We want God to be the center of it. So at times we'll say, Edward, just preach on God. We need to just hone in on the, on the balanced core of what we're doing. Just preach a whole series on God is so we know God well. Okay, but if you did that all the time, what we would come to realize is that God is so far past what we can be It'd be like drinking out of a fire hydrant. I can't be omnipresent. I can't be omnipotent. I can't be all the omnis God is. It's just bigger than I can grab. So you're going to have to break something down and tell me what I can do in this relationship. So we'll run over to mission, for instance. We'll run up to mission. We'll say, okay, well, God being who he is, why did he put me here? He put me here for a mission. Oh, that's cool. Well, what is that mission? That mission is to reach the lost. Jesus came. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. What's my mission? Seek and save the lost. Everything I do needs to do that. When I go down and play pickleball on the ranch, I'm not there to win. I'm there to reach the lost. And I love winning. <laughs> but if in my love for winning, I offend people and lose them to God, then the winning glorified me. It didn't glorify God. So I got to keep perspective. My winning is not for me. I have to stay focused on my mission at your workplace. Stay focused on your mission. You're not just there to work. You're, you're, you, God sent you on a mission there. And so sometimes we'll ask Edward, preach on reaching the lost. Preach on reaching other people. Preach on salvation being more than just for me. It's for God to use me to reach somebody else. Go up and talk about mission. And then we'll talk about Jesus had a ministry. Well, if I'm a disciple of Jesus, what do I need? I need a ministry. And, and far too often people go, well, I'm not in the ministry. Yes, you are. You know how many people we have in the ministry? Look around. You are in the ministry. Whether you're paid or not, you are in the ministry. And the ministry is essentially serving the needs of other people. That's Jake's going to talk about this little blue book that you got in your seat uh, here just a minute. That is your, that's your place to find your ministry. And if your ministry is not there, then we need to talk about how to get your ministry going. You're in the ministry. So we'll ask Edward to preach on serving the needs of others. And then we'll run over and we'll talk about maturing disciples. What does a mature disciple look like? Uh, and next, uh, the next series of lessons that Edward's going to be doing is actually going to be eight lessons on what does a mature disciple look like. This will give you some targets to hit. If you're leading a small group, this will give you subject matter to say, okay, in my small group, I need to tighten the spokes up. How good is my small group doing at serving others? How good is my small group doing at loving people? How good is my small group doing at imitating Jesus? These all become the subjects, even in a small group. Dynamic tension is huge, and it is what keeps people balanced in their association with God, in their relationship with God. Now, what if all we did was talk about how many members we have? Well, we need more. Let's have more members. Let's be a growing church. Let's have more members. When you focus on that, all you do is draw a bunch of people. It's a real shallow church. It doesn't get anywhere fast because everybody's, you know, it's just a shallow. It's, it's, a, it's a swamp of people. We're not interested in a swamp of people. I do want a lot of people saved. But we want the thing drilled down into the depth of who Jesus was so that we can bring glory and honor to God. So part of the reasons why we have small group is so we're not just a swamp of people. We can get in small groups and drill down into the image of Jesus and, and become what he wants us to be. Go ahead and go to the next slide and we can kind of show you underneath there 
what all that involves and you'll see the maturing side and you'll see you know reach the loss and you'll see ministry and and you can get a better grasp of that will it finally dawned on me joe why you're so good at doing that illustration you lived in both eras right the wagon wheel and then the and then the bicycle it was yeah excellent excellent and so when you look at this we need to understand i love you man i really do you need to understand that as a church we did not set out in the early days to try to figure out the 25 to 50 things we could do. Now, there are, there are about 25 to 5,000 things you can do as a church. But we would be foolish to say as one church we could do all of that really well. And so we decided very early on, even before we really understood the dynamic tension of what we were about, that there were five things we were going to commit to as a church. And we were going to do these five things really really, really well, okay? Number one is we were going to create an awesome Sunday morning environment. You're going to hear me say environment a lot. We were going to create an awesome Sunday morning environment where people could come and feel safe, where the lost could come and actually enjoy a church service, all right, where they could rub shoulders with people that were, were a lot like them, and we wanted this to be a safe place where people could investigate the claims of Christ, where people could come to know Christ, and where people could worship, and where people could fellowship. And so we put a lot of energy, we put a lot of resources, and we put a lot of time into Sunday mornings. Second thing we wanted to do really well was youth ministry. We wanted to have an outstanding youth ministry. We wanted to reach 6th through 12th graders, as Joe said, and give them a foundation. We, does, we, we reserved an entire night of the week just for student ministry. We hired a full-time staff member just to run student ministry because we wanted it to be really, really thriving in a really good ministry. And then we said we want children's ministry. We want to do children's ministry really well. So we hired a children's minister. All right. We designated half of our facilities for children's ministry. So we have nursery and we have preschool and then we have what's called kid venture K through fifth grade that all meet simultaneous with us. And so if you're in here, then your child is back there. All right. If they're fifth grade and under and they're getting the same things that you're getting, they're worshiping. They're getting lessons, but they're actually getting more because they actually go into small groups there. Our children's ministry and our youth ministries both are active in small groups. So anybody that shows up on Wednesday night for youth, anybody, any kid that shows up on Sunday morning for Kid Venture or preschool, guess what? They're already connected in small groups with other uh, kids or other teens their age. The fourth thing we wanted to do really well was small groups. And again, we want this to be a church of small groups, not just a church with small groups. So we put a lot of energy into our small group ministry. Half of this auditorium is dedicated to small groups this morning. When we dismiss you, you're going to have an opportunity to go through and check out everything we offer women, everything we offer men, everything we offer couples. Uh, our Celebrate Recovery is showcased out in the foyer. Our prayer ministries, our grief support ministries, our grace place ministries, and all of our community groups will be available over here. We believe life transformation happens better when you're in a small circle than it does when you're in a large row. Connecting people to God and who? Others. And so we want you involved in a group. And then the fifth thing is recovery. We believe in recovery. We are all wounded healers. And Summit Heights wants to be a safe place where anybody, not just an alcoholic, not just somebody that's a drug addict, anybody that has any struggle, any habit, any hang-up, whether it's emotional, mental, physical, whatever, can come and find healing. So why don't we, why don't we emphasize these five things? Because if you look at our budget, we put a lot of resources and finances towards those five things. When we hire staff, we're hiring a lot of staff to run those five areas, okay? We put a lot of emphasis on training volunteers to work in those five areas. And then woven through all of those five is a thing called mission. Every environment we create is for the purpose of mission. Every environment is its own mission field. 
If you work in children's ministry on Sunday morning, you're in the mission field. Your mission field is not Benin, Africa. Your mission field is Kidventure or preschool. If you work in youth ministry on Wednesday nights, you're in the mission field. Okay? It's just not China. It's youth ministry. Okay? If you're working in Celebrate Recovery, you're in a, a very special and unique mission field on Thursday nights at Celebrate Recovery. Okay? All right? It's not Honduras, but it's still a mission field. And if you're in small groups, your mission field is wherever your group meets. All right? My group reaches a lot of young Hawkins families because although I'm not very young, as you pointed out in the first service, my children are... And so they, we rub elbows with a lot of families that our kids go to school with. That's my mission field. So when I'm in small groups, I'm on a mission field. And so every environment we create is for the purpose of mission, whether that's a small group environment, whether that's one of these five things that I mentioned. They're all for the purpose of reaching people for Christ, winning them, training them, sending them, connecting them to God, and then other people. What I love working with Jake about is the guy is so positive-minded that it just really inspires me. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's an inside joke. Ask Jake about it later. Okay, so let's go to the last slide. I, I really want you to hone in on the big picture here of, of um, the book of Ephesians, for instance, is so powerful to talk about what God intended the church to be. What did God intend? He did not intend church in America to become this place where we come in and sit on a pew and ask ourselves the question like, did I really like the music? Did it entertain me? Was the sermon entertaining? Is it something I like? That's American religion. That has nothing to do with what God intended in the church. What God intended in the church is that we would understand that the reason we come up here is to sing to God. It doesn't really make any difference what the quality of the band is because when I'm singing to God, God likes joyful noises. And that's what some of us sing. And, and instead of, you know, worrying about, you know, I don't sing very well. Listen, God loves joyful noises. Just make a whole bunch of noise and you'll make God happy. And that's really all I care about is making God happy. At the end of the day, I want God to be happy. I don't, if the person next to me doesn't like it, they can go sit somewhere else. <laughs> I'm going to make me some joyful noise to the Lord. That's happened before, and too. That's right? happened. Yeah. yeah, one time I had this not said by Ronnie McCoy. Because yeah. <laughs> so I'm here to magnify God, honor God, lift God up. But that's not just here. That's a life uh, style. Romans 12 talks about worshiping God in the way you live. So we do have a worship service we call church. That's not really church. Church is God's people out in the world. We are the kingdom of God in this world. We're here to worship and magnify and lift up God. You can do that. That's, it, you may even be one of those persons gifted in drums or guitar or, or whatever. The only thing I can play is a tape recorder, and they don't make those anymore. So uh, I, I don't get to do this stuff on, you know, the, I'd rather play the drums, to be honest with you, than speak publicly. I think the drums gift is, like, way cool. Or the electric guitar gift. I just think that's way cool, but God didn't give me that. But if you can do that, we need you here to do that. That's a great part of how to serve. You can work in missions somewhere in your neighborhood or around the world. You can work in a ministry somewhere in this community, even if it's just giving food away that is donated to the church. You can work in maturing a disciple. Listen, if you're really good at managing money, you know what we need you to do? teach other people how to do that. That's a huge... I find in life there are three things that break people's foundation apart. It's either marriage, morals, or money. Those three things will crush your life. And if you're good at one of those three things, we need to hear from you, and you need to be teaching another generation how to be good at one of those uh, three things. Uh, so being a member in this church, there's a place for you. We need you in a small group. That's most likely where you're going to find out the beginning place for you to start serving in a church like Summon Heights. So we'll wrap it up with two things. Groups, <clears throat> we believe in groups. Every semester we relaunch our small group ministry. We're going to dismiss you here in just a little bit, but we don't want you to leave. There's a lot of connecting that needs to happen this morning. First thing I want to talk about is our group's ministry. Every 
current and open group. Because we, we have some groups that are closed. Some of our groups have grown to be small churches. They're not small groups anymore, so we've shut that down, and we're trying to get people connected in other groups. Every current and open group that we have is on display this morning on this side of the auditorium. Everything from our women's ministry and everything that they offer and all the different women's groups that meet to our men's ministry and everything that's offered there to what we just call community groups where they're couples led and different couples come in and, you know, singles or, or whatever. Some of those meet in Quitman, some of them meet uh, over in Haynesville, some of them meet in Hawkins, some of them meet in the Holly Lake Ranch. Um, in different age demographics, some of them offer childcare, some of them don't, okay? But there's a lot of different flavors there. Prayer ministry, we have a prayer ministry that meets as a group every Monday morning, and, and that, that is just a phenomenal group of men and women that come together and pray. We have Grace Place, we have a grief support ministry that meets as well. All of that is on display over there. We believe life transformation happens better when you're in a community of people. After 15 years of doing ministry, I am just about 99.9% .9 convinced that people that end up disengaged with church or mad at the church or mad at God or just turning their backs on him completely probably never engaged in authentic community, probably never had a group of people that they could count on that they could rub shoulders with and that could sharpen them and then they could sharpen others as well. And so when life got tough, they just checked out. We don't want that to happen here at Summit Heights. Are we perfect in small group ministry? Far from it. But when I look around and I see all the different connectors that we have, there is a place for everybody to connect. And if it's not in group ministry, then how about connect this way? And this is what I'll close with. You know, in our membership class, we get this asked a lot. What does a member look like at Summit Heights? What does it mean to be a member? If you don't do the transfer membership from other churches and you don't do that, what, what, what does it look like to be a member? And this is what it looks like, all right? To be a member at Summit Heights, what we ask is that you partner with us. And I say partner with, I'm talking about partner with the elders, partner with the ministry staff, partner with other volunteers that are already serving, partner with other members that are already here. But you're partnering with us to do three things. Number one, you're partnering with us to create ministry environments. We don't have this all figured out, and we need visionaries. Henry Blackaby once said, look who God brings to your church. That's what he's about to get ready to do. All right, so what do you bring to the table? What vision do you have for Summit? We may not be able to do it because we can't do everything, but we might just be able to do it if it fits in the model. So we need you to help us create more ministry environments. Yes, we need you to fund those ministry environments. Money follows mission. It just does. All right, whatever you're passionate about, that's where your resources go. So help us create a ministry environment and then give so that we can put the resources in place to make that ministry environment thrive. And then finally, we want you to serve in those ministry environments. We want you creating. We want you giving. Most importantly, we need you serving in those ministry environments. Those packets on your seat have everything 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 from love one and love one has three aspects to it all right it has a backpack ministry it has a financial ministry and then it has a food distribution ministry that sends out food all over east texas and probably it just grows every week all right so it, there's different layers to every ministry that we have and I look, and that's a great example, by the way. I think our food ministry and our prayer ministry and our celebrate recovery ministry are are the model for create fun serve. God brought people into our church that had a heart for food. They also had connections to get food. They've built a volunteer team under them to serve. So they created their funding. And they're serving to make that happen. God brought somebody into our church that had a heart for a Celebrate Recovery. And they built a volunteer team under them. 
and other people buy in. So people are now given to Celebrate Recovery or given to us to support Celebrate Recovery. People are, are, are volunteering in that. God brought three ladies into our church that had a passion for prayer. And now they've built a prayer team that meet every Monday. That's why we exist. And if you're sitting here today and you're frustrated because you just can't connect and you just can't plug in, I want to challenge the snot out of you today. Because this has been the busiest week of my life, getting ready for this Sunday. And you want to know why it was so busy? Because we have so many stinking ways to connect at Summit Heights Fellowship. That's very positive. It is positive, isn't it? We have groups, we have food ministries, we have backpack ministries, we have youth ministries, we have children's ministries. And it's time, this is where I said I was going to challenge you, it's time to take that packet. Inside that packet, there's a sheet of paper, okay? I don't even want you to commit today, but I want you to look at that sheet of paper and say, you know, I might be interested in this. Check that box. I might be interested in this. Check that box. And then lay that piece of paper right here on the table. And then what we're going to do is we're going to meet as a staff and we're going to go through these papers and say, Ashley, here's somebody for children's ministry. Here's somebody for this. Mark, here's somebody for worship. And a ministry person will contact you. So Joe's going to pray. And then we're going to dismiss you, but not really dismiss you because we've locked all the doors. And we want you to go around to these tables and we want you to connect. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, Father, it, uh, it is so cool that as you created Adam and Eve, you gave them a sense of purpose in that garden that would give them direction and foundation and purpose to realize that you are still doing that exact thing. You are creating each one of us with an exact purpose. You are gifting your people in areas of, of uh, worship and missions and ministry and maturing people and in, in uh, working in small... You are gifting your people. And just like in, in um, Matthew where you talk about how that uh, when we're faithful in the little gifts that you've given us, you increase those talents, you increase those gifts. Father, we believe and we see you doing that here at Summit Heights. And Father, when it's all said and done, we want to stand on the other side with you and hear the words, well done, faithful servant. And Father, just personally, I just still remember the days of being lost when somebody came alongside of me who understood what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus, who reached out to me and called me into your salvation, taught me and stood by me while I learned how to make you Lord of my life, and then one day sent me out to do that with others. Father, if somebody hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be where I am. And so, Father, I want to do that for you and with you throughout my life. God, thank you so much for being so clear in the Scriptures about what you're trying to do in our life so that we can find our real purpose and feel so fulfilled in how you use our lives. God, help us to buy into that purpose and participate into it so that you can transform our lives in the name of Jesus. And we pray, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.